everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled, How On-Site Energy Generation Can Save Your Business Money and What You Need to Consider. A recent study commissioned by specialist energy consultancy Utilix found that by 2030, on-site energy generation could contribute 14% of UK's energy needs and help UK businesses save $33 billion, while also cutting carbon emissions significantly. In this webinar, we will cover the role on-site energy generation could play in saving your business money, cutting its emissions, and promoting energy security. How on-site energy can be generate can can how on-site generation can be integrated with your energy management strategy. What to consider when evaluating on-site energy generation. How to identify feasible sites for decentralized energy. How to evaluate decentralized energy technologies for business applic. applic um, applicability, as well understand the contribution of policies and incentives and their sen um, sensitive sensitivities to the business case. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the Q&A chat box at the bottom, type in your questions, and we'll take it up at the end during our Q&A session. There will be an exit questionnaire after the webinar, so if you could please take a minute, few minutes to fill out, that would be greatly appreciated. To two presenters, John Pitt, Director Consulting of Utilix, and Stuart Newman, Director and Advisory Director of Advisory Services at Verdantix. Carol heads up the consultancy team at Utilix. She helps businesses establish how to manage their energy risks through the they buy, use, and generate energy. Stuart is the Director of Advisory Services at Verdantix. It's the independent analyst firm. He helps firms understand the risks and opportunities associated with energy, environment, and sustainability factors. Now, I would like to turn over the floor to our first presenter, Stuart. Stuart? Thank you very much for that introduction, Alison, and good afternoon, everyone. So, Alison was mentioning that it would be myself and Caroline presenting today. I will start off. Uh, bringing to bear a few of the key messages and points that, that come out of the report recently uh, published by Utilix, but uh, produced by Vedantix around uh, realizing the strategic potential of decentralized energy. So just before uh, I get into the main part of my presentation, for those that aren't familiar uh, with Vedantix, we're an independent analyst firm focused on energy environment and sustainability team, uh, in 2007 headquartered in London, uh, also with an office in New York. So in terms of my piece for today, I want to focus only on two real broad themes uh, today. So firstly, how to integrate on-site generation into your firm's broader energy management strategy. The reports we've produced is very much focused on on-site generation, but it sits within a wider energy management program or strategy of many firms, and it's useful to understand its role within that wider program. So the second part of my presentation today, I'll, I'll look at the actual business and environmental benefits of decentralized energy, which was one of the main components of the study uh, which we con conducted and, uh, and UTEX recently published. See how to integrate on-site generation to your firm's broader energy management strategy. On-site generation, decentralized energy, they're, they're terms which we hear quite often, but for the benefit of today's presentation and, and understanding the report itself, it's useful for all to have a shared understanding of what we mean. So into on-site generation, we've interpreted that as electricity generation that's located on the premises of a business or businesses. Importantly, for this re this report and the, the, the data you'll see later, we did limit the size of the, the full capacity size of individual generation units to 50 megawatts. That would exclude the very large utility scale wind farms, the, the very big CHP units that are 80, 90 megawatts plus that you see at some chemical plants or oil refineries. So we are looking at on-site generation. You can see that the small note as well on, on the right-hand side of this slide. We do recognize that with, with these electricity generation facilities or technologies, there's sometimes a 
simultaneous generation of heat which is actually utilized in the facility and we have accounted for that uh, within this framework. So to put things in context for corporates when they're looking at the whole energy management energy ender that they are facing today quite a complex and, uh, and, and dynamic energy ecosystem uh, which is causing uh, quite a lot of uh, concern, confusion among some corporates about what steps they could take to address this. So there are really four main elements that we see playing in this market today. So volatile energy prices, I'm sure no one is surprised to see that item on this slide. It's been uh, in the media significantly over the past three months, not so much volatile energy prices, prices as constantly rising energy prices. If you, if you take the forecast, the latest forecast from DEC in terms of where they see electricity prices going, they forecast an 8% compound annual growth rate from now until 2016. Uh, that's significantly above what we've seen really in the, in the 2008 to 2012 period where for businesses electricity prices were relatively stable. So this, this, this increase in prices above uh, underlying um, growth in, in, in overall GDP is a, is a concern for businesses about how they manage that and how it impacts on their bottom line. Off-site generation, as, as I mentioned, it's the main theme of the report that this webinar is based on, but it's one of the key elements in the whole energy ecosystem which corporates face today. The whole consideration of, of how far on-site generation is appropriate to an individual business um, is, is a sort of energy consumption profile suitable for on-site generation? Do you have the site availability for certain technologies? Uh, what is the payback? What are the overall business benefits? All these questions have to be considered when evaluating the feasibility of, 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 uh, of deploying on-site generation. Chain energy policies, again, not something I'm sure that's a surprise to anybody on the line today. It's been a feature of uh, particularly UK energy policy over the past two or three years, the lack of stability, the lack of clarity. Firms like BT uh, a number of months ago and PepsiCo as well, both cited the lack of clarity around energy policy is one of the reasons they held back on investments, direct investments in decentralized or on-site generation. And so that is uh, a sort of underlying theme which businesses have had to deal with uh, in recent times. Final fourth pillar, extreme weather, certainly has been an issue um, for uh, for many countries. Sort of, if we outside the UK, the US is the obvious example. Uh, the so-called superstorm Stan Sandy caused a huge amount of disruption to the power grid in, in the northeast of the United States uh, last last winter. In in the UK, how far we're having more extreme weather events is is, is open to debate. Certainly, an increase in extreme weather events will threaten grid stability. And if you think about grid stability more broadly, Ofgem themselves, the regulator in the UK, forecast that the 2015-2016 the headroom in our generation capacity will be as low as 4%, uh, which is lower, um, certainly, than, than any of the recent history. And provide a real um, possibility of, of, of blackouts or brownouts, which is something businesses um, are aware of. And and have to think about how they address that type of threat. It's intended to frame the situation that, that, that corporates find themselves in, or, or public sector organizations find themselves in, with respect to the energy management agenda today. So, how uh, reacting to that? What, what, what have we seen through our research? Well, we've identified two um, broad approaches to energy management among uh, corporates and public organizations, and, and we very much see a transition between the two stages today, moving from very much a tactical approach to energy management to something that we would describe as more strategic. And you can really define this transition through five key lenses. If you look at the governance of energy management in organizations, a tactical regime, which is really where the, the majority of firms are still today. Governance of energy management is very much delegated 
related to, to local facilities managers or estate managers that the, the, the overall command or control from, from a central um, authority. If you transition to this more strategic approach to energy management, have this centralized and coordinated approach to managing energy. In terms of the management system itself, uh, firms that still have a tactical approach to energy management may not have any sort of management system in place, and, and where it is in place, it's likely to be quite informal. Think about firms that have, have made this leap to a more strategic approach to energy management, that they, they're likely to have some more formal management systems in place, such as ISO 50001, and certain firms may have gone even further and even got their sites certified um, to this standard. In investment plans, uh, firms that have this tactical approach are likely to adopt siloed projects where individual energy managers or facilities managers uh, have of uh, approval for certain small projects on their specific sites. That differs from a strategic approach is the whole issue of energy management is looked at centrally. There's, a, there's an overall program of investment which integrates the different projects together and maximizes the overall business value. Payback hurdles, fourthly, uh, tactical firms, firms that are very much tactical in their approach, it's two to three years typically is what we see. In. Uh, to be um, to, to be with with firms that are more strategic, where they still face this payback barrier hurdle, often quite difficult for them to overcome. But there are examples where firms are more willing to consider the program overall and certain investments, which which may pay back over a slightly longer period of time. The, just to complete on the slide delivery, so delivery of energy management. Is, is traditionally quite reactive among firms that are uh, relatively underdeveloped in their approach to energy management. They have teams of M&E um, contractors possibly that, that respond to problems with the HVAC system or the lighting. It's firms that are more strategic in their approach take a more e sort of energy services proactive approach whereby their end-to-end -end energy services which help to monitor, control, and, and constantly uh, adjust the performance of their facilities uh, to, sort of, to uh, almost mit and cut out the problems before they develop. So, so far from me, you've, you've heard a lot about Vedantic's views on the world, but we have more interest to the listeners on the call is, is what is reality from individuals in the market who are buying these types of um, energy management products, services, or investing in decentralized energy on-site generation. Well, in, in 2013, this year, we conducted our second annual global study to um, energy decision makers. These are typically uh, vice presidents, directors, or heads of energy facilities, estates, uh, in corporations across the world. They're all uh, one, uh, one billion dollar plus revenue organizations. We interviewed the, the, the key decision maker in each one to learn about their energy management strategies. I see from the chart here the extent of the, the, the study covered 250 firms, 21 industries, and 16 different countries. So what did we find out? The charts have included here, and, and I apologize if it's, if it's difficult to read the title, but I can, I can read that out. But the overall message really is... is are really starting to integrate on-site renewable generation into their broader energy management strategies. The, the first on the left-hand side asks question to the interviewees, to what extent is your organization investing in the following energy management initiatives in the next financial year? And what we found may not be too surprising, that the more mature types of technologies or solutions, energy efficient lighting, lighting controls, HVAC controls and HVAC efficiency, they're receiving the most widespread investment from corporates. They are the proven technologies, the ones they're confident will deliver a return. Demand response, uh, maybe a bit newer, firms are less sure about how to actually deploy that at this stage. ISO 50001, we've mentioned that already. Sometimes firms may not understand the business value of actually um, investing in these types of management systems. And as a result, we, we see these nearer the, the bottom. If you turn to the right-hand chart, we ask the same question, but around uh, on-site renewable energy initiatives. Personally, you can see the extent of penetration 
utilization of these uh, on-site generation technologies is lower than, than the overall energy efficiency measures. But these are larger upfront investments. These types of technologies haven't been uh, available to corporates for as long, so, so they are playing catch-up in terms of uh, the maturity game. But we had the advantage of, of, of conducting study for, for more than a year now, so we can see the change. And we are seeing not rapid but, but steady progress from firms looking at uh, on-site generation and recognizing that it can be a key element in an overall energy management program, especially if you have um, concerns about carbon taxes that you're exposed to, whether you're concerned about um, energy security, whether you have a particular energy and heat profile that lends itself to on-site generation. It's these sort of issues that are really prompting firms to, to, to look at these, these types of technologies. Uh, we picked six because these really represent the vast majority of on-site generation, if you exclude diesel generators, uh, in the UK today. Hi, sorry to, to interrupt, but um, we lost the sound for about a minute. I think okay. at the beginning of the slide, your your sound. So uh, I just wanted to repeat that. Sure. sure. Thank, you. Thank you for letting me know. appreciate that. So for those that, that lost sound, I'll just repeat, we're moving into the second section now of, uh, of my presentation, looking at what are the business and environmental benefits of decentralized energy, which really focuses on the key findings from the report. Now, we did six uh, key decentralized technologies. These really are the, the, the most significant ones in the UK, representing more than 8% of the generation, on site generation capacity uh, in the UK, excluding diesel generators. These uh, technologies, I'm sure, will be familiar to the individuals on the line today. Tri generation may be the one exception. Just to confirm, this is uh, very similar to CHP. It produces electricity and heat, but also um, produces cooling through absorption chillers. So these are the six technologies we looked at. So what did we find when we evaluated? Uh, the, the penetration of these technologies today and, and how we forecast that to progress up until 2030. Uh, in the header of the slide, we forecast that the total install capacity of these 60 centralized technologies will increase by 130% to 17 gigawatts by 30, which will represent 14% of all UK generation capacity. In 2011, the total installed capacity of these technologies uh, was only 8 gigawatts, so we are really seeing a quite substantial increase here. In terms of the different technologies we looked at, it's P that will see the largest absolute increase in installed capacity, uh, from 3.1 gigawatts to, to 7.1 gigawatts by 2030. Pauline pauses, I've got a, a dry there. So moving on to the second slide, looking into a bit more granularity at some of the results, actually focusing on, on the all-important financial savings. So the forecast penetration technologies we calculated would deliver financial savings to UK businesses of 33 billion by 2030. So, so substantial. I know that uh, no doubt a number of you are wondering how we got to these numbers in the report itself that is available, there's the, the, the methodology of the model, the assumptions used are fully disclosed, so you can see the, the approach we took overall um, to, to, to coming to these conclusions. Waste energy um, was calculated as delivering the greatest savings in the 2010 to 2030 period, uh, up to 10, accounting to over 10 billion in total. HP already covered in the previous slide, um, a very similar financial savings.
terms of carbon savings, not something we've touched on in detail at this point, very much focusing on the business benefits, but the forecast penetration will actually deliver carbon savings of, of 350 million tonnes in the 2010 to 2030 period. Into uh, perhaps more tangible context, the annual reduction in CO2 in 2030 will be 24 million tons of CO2 or megatons, and would actually represent a contribution of 9% towards the EU's national emissions reduction target. So we are talking about substantial reductions here. I did go through the, 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 the penetration forecast relatively quickly, but all that information is available in the report, and I felt the, the context, the market positioning, uh, would be more valuable to, to the individuals on the call. But finalize before I hand over to Caroline, who will expand on a, a, a of the themes I've touched on about uh, where to cite different technologies, uh, which industries are best suited to different technologies. Six recommendations for businesses who are considering investment in on-site generation. So firstly, we would suggest you review your firm's existing energy bill and request a three to five year forecast of energy costs. It's, as I mentioned already, DEC predicts that electricity prices are going to rise at a compound annual growth rate of to 8% over the next four years. That can have a substantial impact on any modeling you're doing today of different on-site generation options. It's important that context to produce an accurate uh, business model and business area planning of the different options you have around decentralized energy and mitigating uh, energy price rises. Identifying feasible sites for decentralized energy, also very important. Uh, depending on what type of technology you want to deploy, you need to have the, the, the um, appropriate sites available, and Caroline will, will, will expand on that a little further. Point number three, evaluate decentralized energy technologies for business applicability. We, we've spoken a little about tri-generation. That produces electricity, heat, and cooling. If you really want to maximize the business benefit from a technology like that, you need to be in an organization that has uh, or a facility that has electricity, heat, and cooling demands. So it's important to match your business up to the actual um, output of the generation facility. Fully uh, understanding the contribution of different financial incentives to the business case. There are a whole series of different incentives out there from uh, ROCs, the new um, contracts for difference, which will um, ultimately replace them, the current tariffs for small generation, uh, and it's important to, to understand and recognize how all those different incentives can contribute to the business case. On to the fifth point, request examples of similar success stories from your on-site generation implementation partner. When you, um, when you make an agreement with a, with, with a firm to, to help you through this process, uh, you really want them to show credentials around where they've done this before, ideally in a similar industry, in a similar situation, uh, to really give you that confidence that they'll be able to uh, take you through the whole process. I should note, however, that none of these technologies are new or emerging. These are all established technologies, so, so the risk isn't with the technology in itself. And then just to close on, before I hand over to Caroline, energy procurement really needs to move up the, the, the board level agenda. While it remains, um, while it remains a procurement issue, uh, it's it going to be the whole issue of energy management isn't going to be regarded as strategic by organizations. Then it really needs to be that executive level involvement for the whole energy management agenda to progress and get momentum in firms. Thank you very much for your time today, everyone. As, as I mentioned, Caroline will now expand on, on a few of the, um, the other items that I covered today and some of the other items that we um, included in the report. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. As Stuart said, I'm going to run through some of the actions that you might take as a result of identifying decentralized energy as an opportunity. The future fixes, we're a spaced energy consultancy and with organisations in the public and private sectors to find integrated energy solutions. So that we mean bringing together all the different aspects of energy, from how you buy it, to how you use it, to how you generate it. And it's just the energy that we're going to focus on today. 
Stuart, the outline, one of the main benefits of on-site narration can be that it can save money. It can help ensure that you have a secure supply of energy as and when you need it. And it can also deliver low-carbon solutions that can help to meet your sustainability targets. So I'm going to cover today are how to identify feasible sites for decentralized energy. If it's something interesting so far, how you actually go about finding a site where it would work. How, which technologies are right for you. So whether they apply to your business or your organization. And lastly, thinking about the different policies and incentives that exist and make a difference to the business case for on-site generation. How to look at those and how to evaluate them. Start so with which sites might be feasible for decentralized energy. The first point might sound really simple, but it's about thinking about why you use energy on a site and how much of it you need. And when we think about decentralized energy, we think about electricity, but we also think about heating and cooling as well. And it's really important to think about all the different needs on a site in one go, rather than just one of them at a time. Sometimes a number of different technologies can actually provide heating and cooling and power at the same time, and that might be the most cost-effective solution for you. You. Next thing to think about is your current fuel supply. So, for instance, if you have sites off the gas grid where your heating is going to be provided by oil, for instance, that's really challenging both in terms of the cost but also means you're reliant on fuel oil deliveries. That's where times renewable technologies can be particularly cost effective. Not only can they provide a secure energy supply, they can also um, provide a cost saving as well. So why you're using energy and how much of it you need, we think what it's facing and whether the on-site generation option could be more cost-effective than what you do today. Think about the practicalities. So space might find sound really obvious, but if you're thinking about something like a biomass boiler, for instance, there you'd need some kind of solid fuel to feed into a boiler. Where, say, store that fuel could really impact whether or not that solution is feasible for you. And so that's really important. So we think about the energy demand, what it's displacing, but also the space. Things that typically determine whether a technology might work for you on a particular site. Next thing are things that determine for the site whether or not something would be cost effective. For instance, the tenure of the site, whether or not you own it, whether or not you're just a tenant, and how long your lease is, can all affect the level of investment you're prepared to make and how long a contract you're prepared to enter into. Typically on site generation, we're talking about assets that can last seven to fifty years. So you're going to want to be thinking about sites that you expect to be um, using for a relatively period of time, or at least ones where you're confident that if you moved you could retain or, or get back some value from the asset. So that's why we think about tenure. And last one is planning. So if, for instance, you um, operate in the middle of a city, then things like emissions limits, how high you can build, how big an impact you and your neighbours will all have an impact. If you're in the middle of the countryside, putting up a wind turbine may not be the most popular thing to do. So understanding the environment you're operating in, understanding the different planning requirements are all important in deciding whether a technology could work at a particular site. So for organizations that have got a large number of sites, what we tend to do is the initial site shortlist. So base factors look like digitalized energy has potential, and does it look like it could be cost effective? And that's a good way of filtering the larger state to focus into the areas where you think on-site generation could be most cost effective. Those are the topics to consider in determining whether a decentralized energy is feasible. What I'm going to talk about is how to work out what well, found some sites where it might be feasible, how to evaluate the decentralized energy technology that best suits you. Matters once you've found a site probably with pretty decent electricity and or heating and cooling demand, somewhere you've got space to employ some um, and somewhere that, for instance, you own or have a long lease on, 
once you've identified that kind of site, the next step is to say, well, what could work here? It really depend on how you use energy. So that will determine whether you're looking for an electricity-only technology, heat technology, or something that can do both, or even all three, if you include cooling too. But now how much energy you use. So the energy that you install needs to be sized to meet your demand and the space available at your site. Now, in meeting demand, what we normally do is we look to make sure that you're using as little energy as possible first. So if you've got a site where you've not looked for energy efficiency opportunities yet, typically the most cost-effective way to save um, energy and, and to reduce bills. So it's normally worth making sure everything you can around energy efficiency before you size the generation asset, or at least doing that at the same time. Otherwise, with assets that are oversized, generating electricity that actually it would have been much better if you hadn't used it in the first place. So that's what to think about in terms of scale and size. Then there are those categories that will affect whether for you as an organization a particular technology is right or not. And we can't emphasize this enough. You could have two identical sites with identical energy demand, identical skin and sizing, but two different organizations would choose different technologies and to a series of factors that we'll run through here. So maturity of the technology. Like I said, the technologies that we looked at in our report together are proven technologies. They're available, and they're ones that you can build a firm business case on. What all organizations want to look at, particularly if some organizations are looking at decentralized energy as a way to demonstrate innovation or a way to try something new, perhaps actually you don't want to look at proven technologies, perhaps you want to look at something that's a bit more experimental. I'm prepared to look at something in the middle ground. That's the technology is proven, but not for the use you're going to put it to. And so your view of how mature the technology needs to be will affect which technology you choose. Implementation. You may just be looking at one site to install centralized energy on. You may be looking at 5, 10, 20. That'll affect how big an impact the cost of implementation are going to have on you. And well, the simplicity to install to makes a business case um, pass or fail. An example, if you wanted to do something on 100 sites, it would really matter to you that the rollout process was really simple. You could replicate it, and that once you did it once, you could learn lessons that you could apply again and again. You'd then potentially choose different technologies to somebody that just had a single site to look at with a particular energy problem and where they really were looking for a bespoke solution for that, that site. So implementation and how much you how you want to roll something out matters and will affect what you choose. Next lead time. For lots of organizations today, we're facing into energy targets or budgets or targets that need delivering within a certain time frame. That means that you want that technology to be up and running within those timescales. So it matters then that the technology you choose is available, as in you can get hold of the equipment that you need to the timescales you need it, and also that it can be installed in your horizon. Typically, that's not a problem. Although the planning can extend the time from deciding to do something to actually it happen. So internal sign-off of these projects can take some time. So it might be easier to get a small number of smaller projects signed off than it is to get one larger project signed off. And that may affect how practical it is uh, to meet a particular lead time. Last year, there are a series of other benefits around on-site generation. So as well as a business case, a financial business case, you might want to do this because it supports carbon reporting. Perhaps it allows you to displace a fossil fuel and to start using a renewable fuel instead. Perhaps one reason you're doing it is to make sure that if there is a shortage of energy supply well, at some point in time, you know you're not reliant on the electricity or the gas grid. And perhaps we see organizations that are really keen that anything they do links them closely to their local community. It might be projects like district heating, or they might even to look at crowdsourcing funding for a particular technology and be part of that. 
sort of those other benefits and whether they matter at all will also affect the technology that you choose. We just have examples in the next slide of the kind of technology we might be talking about. So for instance, a diesel generator. Now that's a diesel generator that we all know and love that we see as backup generation around the country. And that kind of technology we're talking about here. It generates electricity. The sizes are available in a range of different um, capacities. It's proven. It's readily available. You can install it on site with minimum disruption. And you might be able to earn additional revenue from generating at times of peak. It's a program that's known as STALL. So that's the Short Term Operating Reserve Program. The challenge thinking about diesel generators in this context is that, as we know, diesel is a fossil fuel. So it really wouldn't help your carbon targets. But if it is as a set as having a provenly available technology that helps ensure security of supply, this might be the best thing for you. So that's why it's so important to think about the considerations we had on the previous slide and to be really clear on your objectives. Why is it you're looking at on-site generation and want to, what do you want to get out of it? If an organization was looking really for a carbon footprint reduction, then a diesel generator wouldn't help, but really help the security of supply. Example then, an air source heat pump. It's quite a diesel generator in some ways. It can provide heating and cooling rather than electricity. So there's a range of scales and sizes. It's a technology that's relatively simple to install, and the times tend to be particularly good. Um, it's actually cost effective off the gas grid, so where you're displacing heating from a fuel like oil, for example, it real sense. With an air source heat pump, you need to use electricity in order to power it. So all your um, emissions and costs of heating might come down, your electricity costs might go up. Now, the benefit of this technology is normally that the benefits of the air heat pump outweigh the costs, but you'd need to stun that when you're working out, is this technology right for me? So those examples of technologies in case you might consider it if you want to reduce your carbon emissions, another that might be your priority if you were looking at secure energy supply. So what about how to evaluate decentralized energy technologies and the kinds of criteria that you might want to compare technology options against in order to decide what's right for you? The last thing to talk about is understanding how different policies and incentives can affect your business case. So when we think about the business case and the costs and the benefits that we need to weigh up, typically start by looking at the costs, the capital and operational costs. We'll all look at the costs of any funding. Maybe that you can fund this kind of investment off the sheet. Maybe you need to borrow money or you want to work with a partner that can fund it on your behalf. Either way, there's likely to be some cost attached to the value of the money that you need to undertake the project. So the time and hassle element. So even just working out whether or not this is the right thing to do requires some effort from somebody. Like Stuart, you might have to up to a partner to do it for you, or you might do it in-house depending on your skills. In any event, you're getting an investment of some kind of consideration and time in order to get on the side of projects moving. So the question in building the business case is whether the benefits of doing on-site generation outweigh the costs. In terms of the cost, sorry, benefits that you can build up in favor of on-site generation, I've already avoided energy costs. So you, the fuel consumption or electricity consumption that your generation is going to be displacing, pair that against the costs of running the on-site generation. Well, is a good example of where you might have a gas fire boiler Things like thermal can provide heat just using solar energy, so you've avoided the gas cost, and that can be a really big benefit. Thing to consider is incentive levies. So by we mean the different policies government has in place to pay typically renewable generators, but sometimes decentralized generators, extra income then for their generation. And that is general financial benefit that you can include into a business case. It's there around security of supply, so particularly if that is one of your objectives, 
and this is something that some organisations put a number on. So for instance, if we avoid so many hours downtime in our stores, this is worth this much to us. And that's qualitative or quantitative benefit you'll consider. Rep benefits are much more commonly treated as qualitative benefits rather than trying to put a value on them. But for instance, you might be able to put a value on the avoided costs of carbon if you're covered by the CRC. So what we do in the business case is weigh up the costs on the left-hand side against the benefits. The C will fall out in terms of payback. So one of the things we were asked to cover today was around the impact of policies on those costs and those benefits. And we have policies as falling into two groups. The pool group on the left-hand side. So those are the things that government is doing at the moment to encourage investment in on-site generation. The things that we've put on the right-hand side of those balancing scales, because typically mean there's an extra revenue or extra income to depend from on-site generation. Larger renewables, funding renewables, the renewable obligation, the smaller ones through feed-in tariffs. Decentralized energy that generates heat, the renewable heat incentive, and for a range of different decentralized energy technologies, exemption from the climate change levy can all be really strong financial benefits that mustn't be underestimated. They can tip a business case from being outside a payback threshold to being well within it, and it's really important to, to evaluate those effectively. The other technologies to take into account are the ones that are encouraging you not to use electricity or to use more carbon efficient energy. There can be some financial benefits there. So as an example, for instance, CRC Energy Efficiency Scheme, we're covered by that there may be some benefits to using decentralized energy rather than importing grid electricity. And that then, depending on what you're moving from and to, a reduction in your reported emissions, but more typically through the fact that the emissions factor is slightly lower for on-site generation than it is for grid imports. So while building those balancing scales, we think about both the positive impact of pool policies that can have a positive, positive energy generating impact on your business case, and also the ones where there can be a cost saving and, and some financial benefit there. Before, it's really important to look at these, and particularly because policies change, and, and, and as policies change, the, the, the financial case for renewables and on-site generation can really change too. We've got two examples here of a situation without subsidies and with subsidies. So we'll take the left-hand side first. There are blocks in the chart. There's a wide brown one that represents the volume of carbon savings. Is in the chart that the brown two megawatt biomass boiler could do really decent carbon savings over its lifetime. However, we evaluated it without subsidies. The net cost of carbon abatement positive. That means the business case didn't stack up. It wouldn't be considered cost effective. The cost weighed by the benefit. We can look at a wind turbine would deliver a smaller volume or carbon savings if it was only a megawatt size, it too wouldn't be cost effective. And in case before subsidies, solar PV really wasn't cost effective at all. Take into account the impact of the feed-in tariffs or the renewables obligation certificates, we move to the chart on the right-hand side. And that is that because all of the blocks in the left-hand chart above the axis, they've all got a positive net cost. When we incorporate subsidies, negative net cost. That means they start to be cost effective. In the wind turbine, as an example, it moves from being a green block above the axis to being a, green, a red block below the axis. That is to move from not being cost effective to being cost effective as a result of taking the energy policy and subsidies into account. So it matters that we consider these in the business case. Not only can they change how cost effective something is, but in this case, Whereas the mass boiler was originally the most cost-effective option, once we took these into account, it would actually be the winter one that was most cost-effective, and so it might be that that you'd look to. So that's given an idea of some of the sensitivity to policy changes. Just to what both Stuart and I have talked about today, we have a decentralized energy 
in terms of reducing energy costs and providing greater energy resilience. But renewable decentralised energy also has a role to contribute towards reduced carbon emissions. Organisations that have already embraced these technologies are also seeing the benefits in terms of being able to take control of their energy futures and obtain a competitive advantage through the, the benefits above. Lastly, by ensuring that energy costs are more predictable and during price certainty, decentralised energy can have a really strong role to play in an integrated energy strategy. That from me, the report that's available on our website that we've um, produced to the Dantics is a link below. I think that we're going to open up for questions. Harlan, thank you, Stuart. So we've got some questions as people continue to type in the Q&A box. I think the first one is for Stuart for your presentation earlier. Um, Stuart, this is from um, an individual working in the, the climate, uh, climate change organization. Mentioned that this is best for companies that have electricity, heating, and cooling needs. Can you give some examples of the types of companies that would be the best fit? Thank you very much for that question. So, I think in this example, you're talking specifically about uh, tri generation. That was one of the technologies that um, that was featured in the study. And that was the one I, I mentioned during the course of the presentation. Uh, as I said, it produces electricity um, and heat as, as well as cooling. So um, what types of firms would that really be applicable to? So, you know, data centers, um, firms with, with data centers is, is one of the obvious um, uh, applicable functions for that type of technology. Uh, the reason being data centers have large cooling demands. Um, they're, they're often attached to uh, larger facilities that have um, heating demands as well, and there's, there's obviously an electricity requirement associated with that. So whether it's banks, insurance firms, technology firms with these data centers, even telecoms firms, uh, can sometimes be applicable um, in those situations. Beyond that, you can sometimes have um, food beverage, healthcare sectors, um, all of which have both heating and cooling requirements, as well as, in almost all cases, firms have some sort of electricity demand. So those are the types of, uh, I guess, sector industries that we would typically see um, tri generation being suitable for. Great. And another question is, does local authority or public sector in the have any impact on rolling out decentralized energy generation for corporation due to the fact that they might be inexperienced with this? Is, is, that, is that for, for me, Alison? I, I, it's for Caroline, because it's when Caroline was, was presenting. I, no problem. So in terms of um, the impact of inexperience in the UK, I think the um, in terms of local authority experience, we see some really good examples of where local authorities are looking at decentralized energy, and perhaps in the broadest sense possible, so maybe for instance in terms of just heating, so where they're able to supply households as well as a large energy user like, like for instance, a hospital with heat, um, rather than just looking at some of the smaller scale projects. So I wouldn't have said necessarily that it's um, local authority or public sector inexperience that holds corporates back. I'm not going to look at it that way. What I would say, I think, though, is that we still find that decentralized energy feels that it's not core or is for many organizations. So um, I think for a lot of organizations that are here um, to you know, bake bread or to run call centers, almost the thing they want to think about is where that comes from and, and to take responsibility for that on site. And so that can mean that quite a big block sometimes can just be um, raising awareness internally that this is something that we can do, it is something that can save us money, and it is something that can have really decent benefits for us. And I mean that sort of resistance to looking at it at all, and then the resistance to actually making the business case fly. So I, th I think that would be my view. So much, and we have here a question. We only have approved projects with a two-year payback. How do we get over that for on-site renewables? 
in terms of the examples I've seen, um, ones like renewables do have longer than a two-year payback. It's there's some brief examples where it just works perfectly, and you might be really lucky. But see, even once you take feed into account, and feed interest into account, or the renewables obligation, the payback is typically longer than two years. What we see is organisations to extend their payback threshold for longer term investments. And that's where those other benefits come in. If an organization is able to say, well, on a back basis, we wouldn't normally pass this, but actually, because of the other benefits we're getting, we think it's worth it, then it can work really well. So the other benefits might be we're helping deliver our carbon target, or we're doing something that our competitors haven't yet. Or doing something that we feel could really benefit our local community and could really show them the way forward in terms of managing energy and emission. Our organizations can extend payback threshold and then to account those qualitative benefits. That's when we can see projects picking up traction and overcoming some of those barriers. And I might just I might just add to, to that point just, just briefly. Uh, all, all Caroline's points, I, I absolutely agree with that. The only addition I would say is, should it just prove impossible to extend beyond two years, of course you can look at alternative financing options for on generation. In, in the public sector, especially energy performance contracts or EPCs have uh, attained some level of traction, certainly more than you would see in the private sector. And even if um, you weren't keen to tie yourself to some sort of performance contract, um, more standard uh, financing uh, is available um, in some cases for these types of projects. So that is an alternative uh, funding mechanism which could get around the payback issue. All right, thank you. And um, a follow-up question. What type of companies are typical recipients of these services then? But do you mean energy is performance type contracts, is that? Yes, I believe that's yes, what I think uh, so. yes. yeah. We see um, energy performance contracts being used in a range of different areas, um, sometimes around energy efficiency and sometimes around generation. It tends to be a kind of organization that's happy to outsource to an extent either the control of the generation assets or the ship of it. So it's an organization, it, uh, to be perfectly honest, I think beyond the public sector, which as Stuart's just said, has got particularly good um, levels of um, penetration of energy performance contracts, or they are still something that's growing. Um, I'm not sure it, there's a particular sector that's picked up on them. It is the nature of the organization and whether it's prepared to engage with a partner over a long period of time and to allow that partner to take control of its, of its energy consumption. But definitely our parent company, Mighty, sees these kinds of contracts in every kind of sector, ranging from the public sector through, for instance, to banking um, or, or a service sector areas. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm just waiting for... Um Um, got one come in. How did you develop, uh, it's regarding forecast models, how did you develop the forecast model for financial and carbon savings? Yep. Uh, for Stuart, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So the, the measure you can expect when we're forecasting, uh, we're trying to, first of all, develop a size, even developing uh, a, a current state to play with decentralized energy or on-site duration, I should say, is quite challenging. If you look at various official figures, whether that's from DEC, National Grid, RAP, Ofgem, uh, they don't all absolutely align. So just getting a view on, on where you stand today is quite challenging. Uh, actually, uh, we we used all these various uh, sources, the, the ones I just mentioned, DEFRA is, um, uh, oh no, sorry, I mentioned DEFRA, DEFRA was used for the carbon model. But yeah, we used all those sources. We combined that with the research we've completed over the past six years in, into um, the energy space. We also, um, as well as the interviews you saw uh, that we conducted as part of our global study, we conducted some um, specific interviews just for this study as well um, of both um, sort of corporate buyers of this type of um, technology as well as some sort of services firms offering these decentralized technologies. So it was by it was by sourcing inputs from all these multiple sources 
um, that we were able to establish firstly a, a baseline of where we are today and also develop a view on, on, on the direction of travel of decentralized uh, energy in the UK. Uh, the sort of financial savings in particular are obviously governed by, uh, to some extent, by the policy measures that are in place, and we recognize they are subject to change. But uh, for the purposes of a model like this, and when you have to um, uh, in, in, in for kind of financial savings, you have to take certain assumptions. The assumption which is stated in the report that we took was that um, the, the sort of policy that exists today is, is the policy we assume that will be in place throughout the, the period of time. We, we accept that there will be some changes which will have some impact on the, on the projected um, financial savings, but uh, it, it, to, uh, um, to forward with these types of studies, you do need to make certain assumptions. That's, guys, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Caroline and Stuart. Uh, that was a very good presentation, very thorough. This web recording will be uploaded onto the 2D platform as well as the site, and you'll receive an email shortly with this information. If there's any questions that you've asked and have not been covered, please use our platform and post a discussion. Again, there will be an exit questionnaire just to remind you to get your feedback on the webinar. Please do take a minute just to fill it out. I hope you enjoyed today's webinar, and thank you. Goodbye, everyone.